safety. Uh, medical supplies for the Ukraine is being taken up and items needed are first aid supplies such as band-aids, triple antibiotics, ointment, uh, disinfectant wipes, gauze, tape, and primary needs are triple antibiotics and the band-aids are the, are the primary needs. Uh, the last day to do that is Wednesday, August the 16th. I know that there's several that will be coming up here Thursday and gathering those things and, and uh, taking them to a drop off place that will uh, get them to Ukraine. So if you want to do that, go with that. You need to do it by that day. Also, no other announcements as far as the sick, uh, other than what we uh, mentioned this morning, uh, John Allman, senior brother Robert Allman, uh, had his congestive heart failure and also some valve problems with his valve. So just remember him and also Paul Leggett has talked to Joanne and Paul is feeling weak and he's had, he's had several falls. And also Joanne is concerned about some tests that she's got to have done this week. So she has for prayer. Just remember them. And also the Kesslers as they're fixing to have a baby this week. And just remember that family in our prayers also. Also, it's coming, it's coming Saturday, uh, August the 5th, downstairs between 2 and 4, will be the anniversary party for Gary and Teresa. And we hope everybody will be able to attend for that. If you will, bow with me and we will get started in our service. Our love and heavenly Father, we do again approach your throne. Thank you so very much for today and so much for the things that you do and give us each and every day, Father. And we again are so grateful that we can come before you and worship and praise your holy name and give a reference to you, Father. And we just again ask that each one of us hearts are in the right place and our minds are focused on, on reverence to you, Father. And our worship is pleasing and acceptable to you. We do thank you again for Jesus as always. We can't thank, thank you enough and thank him enough for the great sacrifice he made for us, Father. And the, the love and patience and mercy and grace that you have on each one of us to, to, to make such a sacrifice. And we just are so grateful because we know that that's, that, that's everything. Everything that we have is based upon that love and that sacrifice that was made for us to be able to have a relationship with you and be to have a home with you in heaven one day. We're, we're truly grateful for that. We pray, Father, that again for our sick, that you'll be with each and every one and be with those uh, with gender and baby that are fixing to be born, Father, and be with the doctors that are attending to her and be with the uh, the others who are sick and the doctors that are attending to them, each one. And we know we have a long list in our, our announcements, bulletins, but be with each one in their particular needs and problems that they may have, Father. We pray, Father, that you will help us as we continue to go about our lives working together to serve you and to please you and that uh, we'll always do the things that glorify you with our lives and be the living sacrifices that we should be, Father. Help us again as we reach out to others to try to teach others and help others come to know your word, Father. And just pray for those brothers and sisters who are, have fallen away or not been faithful. We pray, Father, that something happen in their life to help them to realize the state they're in and to turn from their ways to help us to do what we can to help encourage them to do so, Father. And they'll come back to you. We pray again and ask that you forgive us for our sins, Father. And again, thank you for everything you've given to for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our first song this evening will be 406. 406. Oh, worship the King.
485, we'll see in verses 1 and 3. We are
say. Good evening. It's a joy to be here. I know that there are some tired folks in this audience tonight. Uh, but it's a good kind of tired overall uh, because it was a good three days. Very good, beneficial. Uh, we had not just a good speaker, we had lots of good uh, young people who were with us. And boy, we're thankful for their uh, chaperones and so forth because they play a big role in us being able to do this. We're thankful for all the families that uh, took people into their homes. We're thankful for every person that had any, any role to play. And I, what I like about it is well, this place is a buzz. And I, I don't, maybe you don't appreciate this because ever since I've been here, this church has been good to dive in and work. Uh, but you go other places, sometimes it's like pulling teeth uh, to get anything done. And around here, that's not true. In fact, folk been all over this building today getting ready for uh, what's going to start on Tuesday. Uh, we're going to need everybody's cooperation and patience for the next few weeks. But I believe it's going to be well worth it when it's all finished. So uh, just hang in there just a little bit. And I think we're going to enjoy it together. The Corinthian brethren uh, loved Paul, at least initially. And then false teachers came in, and it's a little bit difficult at times to tell whether they loved him or they didn't. By the time you get to the second letter in particular, even in the first letter, Paul's having to defend himself, to defend his apostleship, to explain why it was that he did the things that he did. It's, it's most interesting to watch him do that. Because in the process, he really does not make your classic defense of himself. Uh, he doesn't get embroiled in, in all, all those personal types of things, generally speaking, that you would expect. Instead, he over and over and over again describes himself in terms of his relationship with the Lord. That is very much so the case when you get to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Last week, uh, we observed about that chapter that it starts off with Paul's service. It's followed by Paul's slavery. And then right after that, as we'll see tonight, it follows with Paul's soldiering. Uh, it's no real surprise when you think about it that the Apostle Paul would use the metaphor of soldiering uh, in talking about his relationship to Jesus. Uh, I don't know of any other individual in biblical history, and certainly not in the New Testament, that spent as much time around soldiers as Paul did. Now, many times it's not because he particularly set out to do that. It's because he's being held, <laughs> Somewhere, he's been go going from one place to another uh, in captivity. But nonetheless, he picks up instantly on the comparisons that are there between the Christian life and, and the soldier, potentially in the, the Roman army, but any soldier as far as that goes. As he gets into this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he begins by saying that he, that is Paul, Paul's weakness showed God's power. So think about it. Look at verse 7, for instance. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Paul was a Jew, but he wasn't just an ordinary Jew when you think about it. Trained at the feet of Gamaliel, there probably were very few, if any, Jews of his age who knew as much about the Old Testament as Paul did. My suspicion is that when he talks about showing God's power, 
that he may have been thinking about uh, Gideon. Now, that was talked about in this morning's lesson, so I'm not going to elaborate a great deal except to correct one thing. If you go back and add up all the different numbers, it probably, and it was my fault, not, not Aaron's, probably was 135,000 uh, soldiers who were the Midianites. And they were, they, were, uh, they were dealt with by how many? 300 plus one. And that one's God, and you can make him be as many a number as you like because he can handle it. Well, Paul sees that in his own life. He, he sees that God is displaying his power through his weakness. Go to chapter 12, if you would. You may remember that the Apostle Paul had a, a vision. It was a vision in which, well, he didn't really know. Did he actually physically go uh, into heaven? Was he in the body when he went? Or was he not in the body? He didn't know. Didn't know the answer to that question. But what he knew was he went up into the third heaven. That's where God is. And he saw things there that, that really motivated him. And yet, he was not allowed to speak about those things. Like John, uh, later when he writes Revelation, some things he can't talk about uh, that he saw. But then, in order that Paul didn't get puffed up, didn't get too proud of himself, he was given a thorn in the flesh. And Paul didn't believe that he could do more for God if he didn't have a thorn in the flesh. And so he prayed three times, deeply sincere prayers, and begged God, take that thorn away from me. Finally, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, we hear God's answer. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I'll rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You hear, Paul? Paul is saying, as a soldier, you want to know where my power comes from? He doesn't say it comes from my sword, although he would have talked about the sword being the Bible, and so there is power there. But the point is, it doesn't come up from a physical sword. It doesn't come from his physical strength, that he can beat everybody that he confronts, like maybe the, the heavyweight champion of the world, that kind of a thing. No, he doesn't have that. But instead, in his weakness, God displays his strength, and thus his soldiering is effective. Now, what is he soldiering for? What is the point? And the point is that he is fighting for a, a, a treasure. And we're going to see more about that as we go along. But first of all, we've got to ask ourselves the question, what is the treasure? Now, brethren... Pay close attention, because this treasure is not just Paul's treasure. This treasure belongs to every Christian. There's not a single Christian who can say that I don't have a treasure. That'd be untrue. We all have one. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the apostle Peter gives us a glimpse of a part of the treasure. When he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's part of the treasure? My sins have been remitted. That's a pretty good treasure. Paul talks about it himself in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, when he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the treasure? Well, I can tell you what part of it is. Having peace with God. No sinner can say they're at peace with God, but Christians can. Christians can say that they're in a peaceful, loving relationship with the Father in heaven. Look again. This time we'll look at Jesus' words. We're going to look at Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. And here, here we discover the Lord making this statement. 
So Jesus answered and said, Surely I say to you, there is no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. What's the treasure? We have a big family. If you do not believe that, then, then you have probably, uh, so far in your life, lacked the experience that would bring it about. But I can tell you, I've had the experience. I've gone to the hospital. I've gone to the waiting room. Back when they used to have waiting rooms, they've about eliminated all those things. But, the, but I've gone to the waiting room while surgery is going on. And it is interesting and sad to sometimes see one individual over there seated all by themselves. And if you were to go up to them, and sometimes I have, and say, uh, who are you here with? They say, well, my husband's back there having very critical surgery. My mom's back there. My dad's back there. Whatever it is, they're all alone, all by themselves. Then over here is the individual's family that I came to be with. It's not just a, it's not just a physical family. It may be brother and sister, mom and dad, but that's the physical family. But then also it is brother and sister and brother and sister and mother and father why, the place is full, full of people. And it's, it's fascinating to watch because sometimes a volunteer will pass through, you know, that, that waiting area and they'll say, who are you here with? And we're just going to do a little imaginary here. I'm here with James Leggett. He, he back there having surgery. I'm here with James. And they go to the next person. Who are you with? Well, I'm with James Leggett. And here you go to the next person. Who are you with? I'm with James Leggett. And you go to the next person. And finally they say, is there anybody here that's not with James Leggett? <laughs> that's the way it works. I've seen it happen. They're amazed by it. But I'm not amazed because the Lord told us that great treasure was going to be there. We have a marvelous family in Jesus Christ, don't we? A marvelous, supportive family that is ours. That's part of the treasure. And then Paul described it further. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, talking about himself, but isn't he talking about the treasure? When he says, not that I speak in regard of need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. You ever notice that worldly people are not content? If they've got $10, they want 20. If they've got 20, they want 100. If they've got 100, they want 200. And if you want to see it in full-blown display, just watch the Mega Millions jackpot. And the higher that thing goes, the more they rush out to, to spend their money on that piece of cardboard. And that's what it is. How many of them are going to win? Well, if anybody wins, usually it's one. And the odds are terrible. But they're, they're not satisfied. They can't be happy with what they have. They can't be content. Christians, we can be content. How can that happen? I don't have anything, you might say. How can, it, how can that happen? I'll tell you how it can happen. Because our treasure's in heaven. That's why. Because we're looking forward to glory beyond, not here. And brethren, if we're sitting here tonight and we're fussing and fuming in our lives trying to make more money, we need to rethink our Christianity. That's not the treasure. The treasure's heaven. And Paul saw it. And he talked about it. And then so did Peter. Listen to Peter in the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a, watch it, living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. 
a living hope. What does that mean? Well, it, it's alive. It's, it's breathing. It's going to come about. It's real. You know, every now and then you'll hear some, some little bitty university. They, they may, I remember a few years ago, Appalachian State beat Michigan in the opening ball game in football season. And they began to pronounce that they were number one in the nation. It didn't take too many weeks to realize that was not a living hope. That was just as dead as it could be. Michigan just didn't have a team that year. That's what the problem was. Or if they had one, they didn't know how to play, and it, which amounts to the same thing. We got a living hope. We got a real hope. We don't have to just imagine what would happen if we have an inheritance. Don't you worry about, about you being without an inheritance if you're a Christian. That's part of our treasure. And we need to see that. So here we have the Apostle Paul in the book of 2 Corinthians. And as he goes through here, he acknowledges, as we've seen, that his weakness showed God's power. But now watch. Paul was a soldier fighting for that treasure that we just talked about. Now, watch with me here. We're going to pick up with two verses. And I'm going to read all the way through these two verses. And here's what I want you to notice as we go into these verses. There are going to be a lot of verbs in these verses. Every one of them is linear. That is, every one of them is ongoing. The fight that we're in, the battle that we are joined in with the forces of evil and with the devil is not a one-time fight. When you beat the devil today, don't expect that he won't be back tomorrow. He's going to keep coming back. And Paul knew that. And so when he writes about it, he doesn't, doesn't put it as a one-time, what, what the Greeks would call a punctiliar action, like a period at the end of the sentence. Uh-uh, it's not that. Instead, it's an ongoing line. It just goes on and on and on forever, kind of like the horizon in a sense of the word, it goes on like that. So listen to him now. Start at verse 8. For we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Now watch him, because he talks about both things in, in an ongoing process. So look at the opening idea. We are hard-pressed on every side. As Paul thought about it, he thought about our lives as being close quarter fighting. I think in modern military terms, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's close up. You know, uh, one sweaty, dirty fighting body right up against another one. That kind of a thing. But then what does he say about it? I'm constantly in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the devil and with evil, but I'm not crushed. What does he mean? I've still got room to fight. You see, if it got, the pressure got too big in a battle in, with the Roman soldiers, you might be killed because you didn't have room to swing your, to swing your uh, sword, or you didn't have room to, to stab with your knife, or whatever the case was, or to use your spear. But Paul says, yeah, they're pressing in on us, but we can still fight. That's what he says. Then he goes on, and he says, we are perplexed. Perplexed. That's a, that's a word we understand in one way, but, but, but Paul, what are you perplexed about? You know what it means? I can't see an exit. If they announce you're in a strange place, and they say, everybody need to get out of here, the place on fire. Would, you might describe yourself as perplexed if you couldn't find the exit. That's the idea here. So here he is in the middle of the battle. He can't see a way out. He can't see where it is. But then watch his next word. But not forsaken. And the wording here means I'm not at a complete loss. Yes, I'm wondering where's the exit, but I'm not at a loss. Why not? Remember, he's fighting with God. God's on his side. That's why he's not at a loss. Then he goes on, and he said, persecuted. Now we might say, well, I, I kind of have an idea. No, no, I doubt it. I didn't. I'll say it that way. The word persecuted here means 
hunted like an animal. I've talked to some of these fellas that are deer hunters. They're dead certain that they, that they got that deer. They found the, they found the blood drops. And how do, they, how do they work that? Man, they won't go to, they go till dark. And if need be, they'll get their flashlight and they keep going. And they're going to hunt and hunt and hunt. They're looking for that animal that they shot that is their prey. The Apostle Paul says that's the way the devil works. The devil is hunting for us like we're prey. He's trying to defeat us all the time. That's the idea there. So that's the word persecuted. But then he says, not forsaken. And there we'd use the word not abandoned, not deserted. God's not going to leave me alone. The devil may be chasing me, but God's right there with me. He's going to make sure that I can make my way through. But then he goes on, struck down. You know, in a battle with the Roman soldiers... If you ended up on the ground, you just counted, you're dead. That's it. Somebody's going to take a spear and just run it right through you. Or a long sword, they're going to run it through you. You're dead if you're struck down. Well, Paul says, I'm struck down. But now watch, because he didn't stop there. But not destroyed. I'm not dying. Now, be careful. Because when he uses this word here, he's talking about spiritually. And we need to remember that. Physically, could he die? Yes. But spiritually, uh-uh. Not going to happen. The devil may think he's got me, but God's going to help carry me through. That's the idea. So you see all these soldier elements that Paul is bringing in here as he thinks about himself. He's fighting for the treasure that we just saw a few moments ago. Now watch him as he talks about it with the Lord. If there was ever a time in the Apostle Paul's life when he might have thought that the game was over, that he'd lost the fight, it was all done, I think it might have been in Acts 23. In Acts 22, he's taken captive. Now, (laughs) taken captive is almost, almost too mild a way to say it, don't you think? Because the Jews had gotten hold of Paul, and they were intent on beating him to death. Right then, right there. They were going to kill him in the streets of Jerusalem. That's what they were going to do. But a Roman commander came along. Don't you suspect that was God's providence? I do. I suspect that. Can't prove it, but that's my best guess. God's providence. He's not going to let him, he's not going to let him die. You know, not not at this, in this case. And so what happens? The Roman soldier takes him and, and lifts him up. And of course, Paul, <clears throat> Paul says, uh, can I speak? And, and the, the Roman soldier said, basically said, uh, you know Greek? <laughs> he thinks he's this, an, an Egyptian rebel who's leading, leading a bunch of rebels against uh, the Jews and against the Roman soldiers. And so he's shocked that the Apostle Paul can speak Greek. And he said, oh, yeah, I, as a matter of fact, I, I do. You know, I'm that kind of a fellow. He said, uh, so he, he gives him permission, permission to speak. And he speaks to the Jews, and they just about want to kill him again. The Romans got to pick him up and tote him inside. Well, the next day, what does the soldier do? He brings him before the council. And Paul is sharp enough that he picks up on the council probably because he knew them since he was a young man. And he looks at that council, he said, well, over here are a bunch of Sadducees, and over there are a bunch of Pharisees. And so he stands up, and what does he say? I'm here today because I'm being charged because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And boy, the Pharisees all say, well, we need to listen to this guy. He might be a pretty good guy. And the Sadducees all say, let's kill him. And they go at it again, and the Roman soldier rushes in to save him. And meanwhile, a group of Jews, unknown to Paul, although he will find it out from his nephew, a group of Jews take a, an oath, and they say, we're not going to eat again until we kill him. That's what's going to happen. But now listen to God as he speaks to Paul, because he plays a critical role. Verse 11 of chapter 23 But the following night, 
the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, you must also bear witness in Rome. Now, I don't have the answer to this question, but have you ever wondered if Paul took that one statement from the Lord, and that's why he said, I appeal to Caesar. I don't know the answer, but I got my suspicions. Because the Lord said, I got a, I got a job for you. It's over there in Rome. You're going to deliver my word there. But the most important thing here is what? Paul is a soldier fighting for the treasure. The treasure of being in Christ. The treasure of being a Christian. And then we see Paul's weakness and death were a path to life. Now here again, we're talking about spiritual death. He did die spiritually. If you're a Christian tonight, you died spiritually, didn't you? Yeah, you were dead in sin, but then you died to sin. So we've all died. Paul did. And so listen to him as he picks this up in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. The dying of the Lord Jesus. Paul understood that he had died. Listen to Jesus, because Jesus picks it up in John 12, in verses 23 and 24. Listen to him as he talks about it uh, in John 12. Listen to what he has to say as he talks about it. Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is coming that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. What? You got to die to produce. In other words, if you think about it, what we're seeing and hearing from Paul and from the Lord is this. Persecution produces evangelism. Now look at Acts 8.4 and see if I'm not right. Where the, we find that they're being persecuted. They're being driven out of Jerusalem and Judea. And listen to what Luke writes about them when he says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Persecution produces evangelism. You know, sometimes, and I, I want to be careful here, there are things that, that I, I'll, I'll have to be honest with you. I'm not, I'm not even ready in my own life to ask for. But do you think we'd grow more as a church if we had to endure a little bit more suffering? You think that might be the case? It was in the first century. I can tell you that. Persecution produced evangelism in the first century. The Apostle Paul died spiritually to do what? To display Christ. Think about it. In verse 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, here's the way he said it. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal body, <clears throat> or mortal flesh. So what does he say? We who live are delivered to death. Maybe the, the young people's song that we used to sing a lot in days gone by, don't hear it as much anymore, but it's really just taken straight from Galatians 2.20. What did the Apostle Paul say? I am crucified with Christ. Uh, was it in the last couple of days? I want to say Aaron said, uh, put there, I, I've gone to the electric chair for Christ. I think that's the way he portrayed it. And that's a good way to say it. Uh, people don't go to the electric chair and get out. Uh, well, not personally. Somebody takes them out. They're dead when they go. When Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, you can just put there, he died. He died. 
But then what does he say? Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, Paul was dead. Who lived inside him in place of Paul? Jesus did. Now, I've got to ask all of us, brethren, me included, is Jesus living in you? Sometimes we sing that song, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. We sing that song, right? Can I honestly say that? Is that the way my life is? Am I letting Jesus' life shine through in my life? Very important. The Apostle Paul put it another way in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, when he said, for me to live is Christ, and to die, now he's talking about physically, is gain. As long as Paul is in the flesh, who's he living for? Not for Paul. He's living for Jesus. He's doing what Paul would want to do? No, he's doing what Jesus wants him to do. He's turned his life over to him. He's a soldier who has turned his entire life over to the commander-in-chief. That's Jesus. And he's going to give his life in support of of that commander, of Jesus. That's what we need to do. That's the way we need to live, just like Paul did. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12, then, he goes on to say, so then death is working in us, but life in you. Why did Paul allow himself to, or, or involve himself in putting to death that old man of sin? What was the purpose of, of him dying to sin, so that everybody else could learn how to live. Live eternally. Again, same thing. Watch him. Persecution. Spiritual, spiritually dying to that old man of sin. That produces what? Evangelism. It produces a benefit and a growth in the church. That's the way Paul saw it. And so, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when he's going through the resurrection chapter, and boy, you ought to watch that chapter. It's a beautiful chapter. Every time you see the word uh, risen or raised or some form of it, you can underline it, and let me tell you what you can put there. It's passive. Jesus was not, did not raise himself. God did. God raised him from the dead. And over and over and over again, Paul promotes that idea. So listen to him now as he's been talking about the resurrected Lord, who is the very basis of our faith. He picks up at verse 30, and here's what he says. And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Did Paul live a threatened life? You know he did. Everywhere he went, somebody trying to kill him. I mean, you can start right with his baptism in the city of Damascus. When he started to preach the truth, what happened? They laid a plan to put him to death. And what did the brethren do? Paul, we, we got to let you down out of, over the wall in a basket because we don't do that. You're a dead man. He goes to Jerusalem, and what do they try to do? They try to kill him. And, and you can name how many other places in his, in his missionary journeys where the Apostle Paul went there to preach the gospel, and they wanted to kill him over and over and over again. Paul, do you stand in jeopardy every hour? Well, I know he does, and you do too. And so what does he say? Why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is that to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Everything we believe in revolves around one critical thing. God raised Jesus from the dead. That's what Paul's saying. He said, why why does he keep on? Why does he put up with all they put him through? I'll tell you why. Because he knew the treasure. And he was looking forward to the resurrection from the dead. But not just 
not just for himself. Listen to him in the book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. All right, now, brethren, I want us to think about this. Why did Jesus die? Now, you could answer that and say, well, he died for me. That would be a true answer for any one of us. That's a true answer. But you also could say he died for the church, didn't he? He died for his bride. And by the way, stay tuned, because next Thursday morning, I'm going to talk about that in depth. We're going to look at, the, we're going to look at that in depth next Thursday morning as we compare the marriage to the church, because that's what Paul did in Ephesians chapter 5. That's exactly what he, the road he went down. But what, what do? Jesus died for the church. Now, what about me? If I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm going to follow him. What should I be ready to do? Die for the church. That's what Paul said he did. He's willing to die if it will advance the cause of the kingdom. If it will advance the work of the body of Christ. What a fascinating way to look at the Christian life. Paul, as we opened up and looked at, at, at the beginning of this lesson, Paul was a soldier for God, fighting for God. But as he did that, what did we see in him? We saw that Paul says to us that his weakness sh shows God's power. He went on to say, I'm a soldier fighting for the treasure. And we saw some of the elements of that treasure. It's worth fighting for. It's worth it to go to heaven, to have that inheritance from God. And then finally, we saw that Paul's weakness and his death were advancing life. Giving life not just to himself, because he certainly did that, but also giving life to others so they could live eternally. So now I think all of us need to pause. And we need to ask ourselves the question, am I a soldier for God? If you are, then number one, if I am, number one, what? I need to realize the only way I'm going to be strong enough to do this is if God is behind me. Number two, what am I fighting for? You know, a soldier has to have motivation. Study a little bit in the Old Testament, and there have been other cases, by the way, in history, when soldiers go out uh, to fight for a thing, and when the battle begins and, it's, and it explodes, you know, on the scene, uh, they'll run. Why? Because, hey, I didn't buy for this. I got in this army because I wanted all the spoils we're going to get. I didn't get in to die. <laughs> you, know, you see that over and over again. We Christians, we're going to go all the way to the end. Why? Because we're going to go to life, to real life, to eternal life. That's why. And so we are willing, like Paul, we're willing to die, or we ought to be, willing to die so that we can advance the cause of Christ. That's our soldiering that goes on. Now, we've seen the treasure tonight. The question is simple. Is it yours? Is every element that we talked about tonight in the treasure, is it yours? And if it's not yours, then what better time than right now to make a change? Make it yours. Come while we sing. When the door is
Our closing song this afternoon will be 181. 181, we'll sing the first verse and be dismissed in our closing prayer. If there's anyone here tonight that was not able to protect the Lord's Supper, you may exit now and it has been prepared for B2. B2. 181, first verse. Lord, we ask for a safe travel home until the next point in time. In Jesus' name I pray.